Any other questions about grades of class or anything like that? Great, okay. So, um, what we're doing today is I'm giving a presentation on my doctoral research, which, as Mr. Haheim has mentioned, is very related to the kinds of things that we're doing in this class. I'm coming at it from a bit of a different perspective. Um, I don't want to talk about me because you guys didn't take this class to learn more about me. You took it to learn more about how to get better at getting better. But in the beginning of this, I'm going to talk a bit about me so you can understand where this research came. Okay, so this is the title page of my uh, dissertation proposal. It was accepted last spring. Um, I'm currently working on a draft of the full dissertation. Yeah, so as I said before, um, I'm going at this stuff from a bit of a different perspective than uh, Mr. Haheim is. He's, uh, he's coming from largely the place of the books that you guys are being asked to read and the other ones that are listed in the um, the extra credit segment of the syllabus uh, that are all great. The, uh, the way that I'm looking at my research is largely based out of these books exist, and there's a lot of interest in this from the community of performing musicians, especially the community of performing classical musicians. But a lot of stuff in these books, like when we talk about Malcolm Gladwell, is just people talking randomly, and it might be right, and it might be wrong. We don't necessarily know if what these books are saying is true. Um, so what I'm doing is coming at this from the perspective of the peer-reviewed science that is actually underneath these books that a lot of it is built on and saying which part of these books that everyone's been reading matters and which parts are completely wrong and which parts don't matter. Um, so like I said, I want to go very quickly about the stuff about me because I think it's the least interesting part of this, but just so you understand where this stuff came from. I grew up in Atlanta. I also grew up a massive Gator fan. My dad went to the University of Florida before I was born. Um, I went to UF, I did my first two degrees there, undergrad and masters, I marched on the drum line, I played in the orchestra, I did the wind band, I did like all the stuff that you do when you major in music at a place. Um, come on. No. These were most of my musical mentors. The guy in the top left is Rick Dietrich, he was my high school percussion coach. Uh, for the percussionists in the room, he's a Cleveland style player, he studied with the Janssiches. Um, Below him, that's Bill Wilder. He played with the Atlanta Symphony until about last year. Um, I studied with him in the second couple years of high school. Top right is Dave Waverite, the director of bands at the University of Florida. Bottom right is Chip Berkner. I think he's the associate director of bands. He's the third guy in the band totem pole. He's also a percussionist. Guy in the center is Ken Broadway. He's the director of percussion studies at the University of Florida. Um, these were my main musical influences. These guys taught me how to play. Um, at varying degrees between them and other musical influences, certainly they're um, varyingly supportive or varyingly just wanted me to do my job and didn't care how I did it or you know the sorts of things that mattered to me versus other people who really cared about me. The core again is these dudes taught me how to play percussion. Um, end of my undergrad, I looked up and I didn't have a job lined up, which many of you either will find yourself in that scenario or have already have. Um, and I didn't want to leave Gainesville. I figured, why not do a master's and stay there and keep getting better? So that's what I did. Uh, nope, that's not what I wanted to scroll. <clears throat> uh, this whole time, I thought I was going to be a player. I thought I was going to get the kind of job that Mr. Hallmark has had, even though nothing in my resume or the way that I was spending my days would suggest that I was remotely doing that. Um, the vast majority of my work at that point had been in drone line and solo work. Florida and the percussion department, we spent a lot of time playing solo forever. Uh, I barely gigged at all. I was kind of a big fish in a small pond scenario, and I thought I was great just because my hands worked. With the benefit of hindsight, I was delusional. Uh, during my master's, in addition to playing velocities and rebounds and all this, this great um, stuff and prepping for a Carnegie Hall concert we did with Joe Alessi and um, all of that stuff, I also co-founded a student group for the men's basketball student section at Florida, which has absolutely nothing to do with music, but it was something I was super into, and I did that. So there were four other members of us, there were five co-founders, and we worked closely with the athletic department because at the time they looked and said, Duke has a student group for their student section, and their student section is the best in the country, and we want to be that, so we're going to try this thing. So we created an official student government organization within the University of Florida. Um, we got, I think, like a very small amount of funding from the university. I don't even remember, it might have been like 80 bucks total. Uh, but through that, um, I had already been close to the basketball program with connections through my dad. He worked in clothing and had done custom suits for a bunch of the coaches and stuff. 
so I had connections through my dad, and then um, through co-founding this group, I had a bunch of connections through me. And getting tight with the athletic association hooked me. I was hooked on how they did business and how they treated each other and the way that they just handled their day to day. One day in 2014, I was at roughly the spot when this picture was taken. This is the men's basketball practice facility at the University of Florida. And um, this specific day changed my life, and it's probably more of the reason why I'm here than any other day or thought in my life. Um, I was in this practice facility here um, during a men's basketball practice. I believe if this was the right, the correct year, we went to the Final Four that year. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the beginning of that year. And uh, I remember watching Billy Donovan coach his team, and I remember in the back of my mind thinking, I want to be that. I want to be the guy who's coaching um, these elite athletes and doing all that stuff. And then in the back of my mind, something went, you idiot, you should have spent all this time playing basketball instead of playing drums. You, you, you have close to that off, and then something further back in my mind said, well, why not just be the Billy Don and the drums, and that is largely what I've been doing. The people on the previous slide were the ones who taught me to play. These people are the ones who inspired me to be okay with admitting to myself that I was striving for greatness. Um, they taught me, um, well, what I have here is what it was to strive to be great. Yeah. Um, I have never learned that. Um, I don't necessarily want to say never. I have not primarily learned that from musicians because in my experience most musicians do not speak in terms of the word greatness. Um, none of these six people were ever my teacher, two of them were my boss by like a couple of runs up. Top left, that's Alicia Longworth, she's the director of marketing um, at the University of Florida and several other jobs. Top middle is Tim Walden, softball coach, top right is Jeremy Foley. Uh, retired athletic director, bottom left is Mike Hill. He was the assistant athletic director for men's basketball. He's currently the athletic director at Charlotte. Bottom is Roland Thornquist. He's the uh, women's tennis coach. Bottom right is Billy Donovan. He was the men's basketball coach. Now he's the basketball coach for the Oklahoma City Thunder in the NBA. Watching the way these guys handled their business wowed me um, that I had never seen musicians work at a level of efficiency and a level of drive and a level of taking care of the other people on their teams the way that everybody on the athletic side of this campus did. Uh, things that were assumed that you would do this, that they were the bottom level of how you had to act on that side of campus were like the top level of how you treated people in the music well, in the music department at Florida. And being around other music departments here and hearing what people have said it is at, uh, at other places that they've been, it's largely been my experience that uh, that's not a unique thing to Florida, that that's just sort of the way that things work. Um, yeah, so the example of these people, and again, none of them are my teacher. I never had an hour a week lesson with any of them. Um, was largely why I spent a year in audition prep that was primarily at 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. after working at a guitar center or teaching high school professional ensemble and drum line or working in the Gator Ticket Office doing whatever jobs I could to help pay rent. And then at night, after all the students at that school were done since I had graduated, going back and um, prepping for the audition here. So, um, so I was asking why. Why is there this difference between the way musicians handle their business and the way that athletes and their coaches and their administrators handle their business? Who knows who this guy is? It's Anders Ericsson. This is the dude from which all of the ideas that we're talking about in this class largely started. Um, he's not the only guy, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, stuff that's come after him. Uh, I haven't looked for a picture of him in about a year. Yes, about a year ago, this is the best picture I can find. This is one I found for a uh, presentation I gave at the College Music Society outside of Seattle. Um, as a Gator, I personally hate that he works for FSU, but he does, and he's the guy, so Give him his due, he's the guy, he's the dude who wrote Peak, the other book that you're going to read soon. Um, I hate reading to you, but this quote matters. Even with an exhaustive education, students are often unprepared or at least unaware of what they must do to find and win a job in the professional orchestra industry. This subject matter seems to have been relegated to the venues of trade journals, magazines, and conferences, rarely finding a place in the curriculum of major universities. That's from a dissertation um, that was written in 2011 for uh, student bass players, and I, I've skimmed that dissertation. It's largely about excerpts and preparing for things and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I add this only to tack on to what Mr. Hahn said at that 
this kind of class fills a need that music training is largely not filling. And my dissertation proposal has, I think, three or four quotes that um, also back up this idea. And I think there were several that I cut because basically my chair and I looked at it and said, we, we have too much of this. Um, musicians and our teachers are largely very good about talking about music. We're good about talking about technique and style and how to interpret one phrase in Mozart versus the exact same thing written in Beethoven versus written in Stravinsky. We're great at talking about that sort of stuff. In my experience and in largely the felt experiences of people who have thought about this stuff within music, we are not as great at the process of actually doing it or at talking about the process of a life of doing um, this professional music thing. So my solution to this was to look elsewhere, to look in different disciplines. And um, during the first few years that I was here at NYU, my study was largely going to be bigger. I wanted to look at parallels not only from sports, but also from the world of business and from the world of infantry combat. I was fascinated with the way that Navy SEALs and Force Recon Marines and Delta Force guys would talk about the way that they train. So uh, sports, business, and combat. What do those three things have in common that we as musicians largely don't have on a day-to-day -day basis? I would say that we just don't have on a day-to-day -day basis. Constant reinforcement of mechanical skills that we consider facilitated in the levels of which they're performing at. I mean, if we're practicing, we're constantly reinforcing. You're practicing, you know, you're not in front of, like, one of, like, you're not in front of John Pons every day, like, you would be a drill instructor or your basketball coach. I hear you. Watching them meticulously reinforce everything you do. I can go for that. So that's, um, you're talking about, like, what, a, what an athlete would call in practice or what we would call in a lesson or in a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. From the day-to-day -day perspective of like once you're doing the job, right? So a, a regular on Broadway or Mr. Hahn at the Met or Chris Lamb at the Philharmonic doing the job day in and day out. What do we not have that sports, business, and combat have? We, const we do not, and they do, constantly have someone who is trying to beat you. In sports, there's always another game where someone is trying to make you lose. In business, there's always someone who wants the customer to go to them instead of you. They're, they're either trying to put you out of business or they're trying to at least take some of your business. And in combat, they're trying to kill you, right? When Gloria gets up and plays Don Juan and Brahms later, I hope no one's going to run up and try to take the violin out of her hands, right? No one's going to run up and like play defense between the bow and the violin. There's no one actively trying to make her worse. In those three disciplines, there is, always. I haven't talked about this lately because my research has gotten smaller and, and more focused, but my suspicion is that that ever-present specter of someone trying to beat you is largely the reason why these groups have turned to sports psychology and a, uh, a research area I'm interested in down the line, um, performance culture and, and organizational culture, and we haven't because we're not as worried about someone beating us every single day, so we haven't had to look at it. Okay, so these are the three primary research areas that my research comes from. Expert performance. This field is largely defined by Erickson. When you read Pete, you're going to get kind of the, uh, the 90,000 foot view of what this is. Expert performance is largely about why is LeBron LeBron and everyone else who plays basketball not, right? Why is Yo-Yo Ma him and there are only a couple of cellists at that level and everybody else isn't there? What separates them? What are the factors that make the elite elite and everybody else not? Sports psychology. Uh, this is also called performance psychology, is largely about um, setting, creating a, an environment within your mind to that is conducive to the best possible performance in that moment. So expert performance is largely about a one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year window of a career at the top. Sports psychology is largely about in the moment I'm about to you know, go into combat, I'm about to go into the Olympics, I'm about to play a recital at Carnegie Hall, I'm about to play a junior recital here at NYU. What needs to happen in my mind so that I play the best I possibly can? Motor learning is basically the science of how we create muscle memory, right? Muscle memory is not actually memory that's encoded in your muscles, it's in your brain remembering how to tell your muscles what to do to accomplish something. Motor learning is the study of how we create that. Okay, so this guy, Colin Hill, this dude wrote his dissertation uh, basically on top of Erickson's work, applying it to the percussion world. On the left is the front page of his DMA dissertation from the University of Kentucky. On the right is the first page of his article in Percussive Notes that I don't know the year of that. I believe it's 
roughly right after this, 13 or 14. Uh, I show this to you for a couple of reasons. One, so you can get used to physically seeing the world of in academia, we do the hardcore research, and this document I think is like 80, 90 pages long. This page over here is like four or five pages long, and that's the only one anybody read, right? I don't know. My guess is maybe 15 or 20 people on planet Earth have read this. I'm one of them. And, I don't know, a couple thousand have read this. This is in Repressive Notes. This is the most important journal. It's really a magazine for, uh, for percussionists. This is very important work, it's valuable. Basically what he did is he inter interviewed 36 prominent percussionists, Luciano, Zach, Danny, we would know all these guys' names. Um, oh, well, maybe, if he interviewed you, let me know. But you guys would know the names that he interviewed. Uh, and uh, he basically went to PASIC a couple years in a row, caught him and did like, I think, 20 minute interviews. And uh, essentially asked them, when did you hit 10,000 hours? How have you done these various things that Erickson talked about um, in this 1993 study? With respect to Dr. Hill, there are some problems with this. One is if you read his, uh, his article in PASIC, or in uh, Percussive Arts, uh, excuse me, Percussive Notes, uh, he talks about the 10,000 hour rule and he never refutes that um, Gladwell was kind of wrong about that idea. Uh, so this is an important engagement with these ideas in a, uh, in a popular way, but it doesn't engage with them fully, and it doesn't engage with them, I would say, correctly. Okay, this is the front page of Erickson's 1993 study. This is, um, this is the thing. This is where expert performance started. The study that you read about in, um, in Colvin, about the violin players, this is the front page of that study. This article, I think, is like 30 pages long. Um, I believe I cited it somewhere between five and ten times in my proposal, in my full dissertation. It will probably be cited a bunch more. This is sort of the latchkey moment where this research started. Uh, the other thing I call your attention to, if you look at the authors up top, Erickson wasn't the only guy on this. In the sciences, especially in the like hard sciences, one author of a peer-reviewed journal is very rare. You usually have multiples. Okay. This also, I think, is a very interesting slide for you guys. This is, uh, these are three articles that are all published in the same issue of, what is the name of this journal? Um, something Psychological Science, maybe you guys can read that up there. Perspectives on Psychological Science, I have it in my notes. Uh, there is another special issue that is almost exactly like this in the journal of um, Intelligence. It's basically the same idea. One thing that is important for you guys to know that I think with respect, Mr. Haheim hasn't done a great job of talking about in this class, although for the audience of this class, I'm not sure that it's that important, is that there are very well-respected scholars who disagree with Erickson. Erickson's, again, at the 90,000 foot level, very simplified. Erickson's thing is what determines how LeBron became LeBron, how Yo-Yo Ma became him, blah, 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 is deliberate practice. That's the, the vast majority of the defining trait that sets those people apart. There are these other scholars, led by Brooke McNamara and David Hambrick, who basically say, no, that's wrong. Deliberate practice matters. Um, I think in one of these articles they say it's roughly 18% of the difference between people who are really good and experts. Uh, their position is that deliberate practice matters, but it is not sufficient to describe the difference and to explain <coughs> the difference away. In this issue of this journal, the scholars who disagreed with Erickson wrote a journal article on the left. I believe this is like 20 pages long. They gave Erickson a chance to respond. I think this is like four or five pages long. And then they gave the scholars who disagree with Erickson a chance to respond to his response. I show you this to let you know this research, this is a big deal. There are a lot of people talking about this. There are a lot of people arguing about this. And a lot of people are publishing articles about these concepts. It's not just books that you know small business owners are reading to get some idea how to run, um, run their businesses better, and, and CEOs for that matter but also there's significant scholarly interest in this stuff. Okay, this is an article that was published that I'm using just to demonstrate uh, application in a scholarly way of these concepts to disciplines outside the field from which they come. So a lot of sports psychology comes, spoiler alert, from sports, and here we're talking about applying that to things other than sports. Performance coaching in sport, music, and business. Uh, from Galway to Grant, who's Galway? Say again? Uh, it's Timothy. 
inner game of tennis, which then spawned, I think, like 30 more specialized um, inner game of whatever. So there's an inner game of music, right? Sorry, not the, at least who Angela Mountain means is not the flute guy. Okay, so um, we at some point in this class we're going to talk about the idea of domain general versus domain specific. Have we talked about that yet? Have you guys gotten to that in the reading? Okay, so no. Domain general is an idea that um, is applicable and, uh, and applies to, it applies regardless of what domain you're in. So if you're playing timpani, or if you're shooting basketballs, or if you're shooting guns, or if you're trying to sell iPhones, these concepts matter. And then there's domain specific, which is how it applies specifically to what you're doing. So for example, within music, it's bad to rush. How a violin player manages to not rush, and how a timpanist manages to not rush through technique and through physical input, um, physical use of that idea, implementation of that idea is going to be different. Domain general, domain specific. Okay. Disclaimer: I am not a gun nut. I've only been to a range once in my life. The conversation here is not about guns. Please do not freak out about the second and nine and blah 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 blah. This guy is a former uh, force reconnaissance marine. Um, then he was a, uh, a private military contractor, then he was a CEO. I don't know if he's still a CEO of his company anymore, and he's still a firearms instructor for, I know law enforcement, I know civilians, I'm not sure if he does contract training for the military or not. Uh, this is a dude within the gun community, people who are excited about learning how to work guns more, whether that's law enforcement or just you know, responsibly armed citizens, they're really excited about this dude. This is like one of the names in your business. All right, so um, I'm going to skip a little bit of the clip in the middle. Uh, what he's talking about here is what's known as the speed reload, which basically is when there are no bullets left in your gun and you really need bullets left in your gun right now. Um, a couple terms he uses, he says flagging and sweeping, that refers to pointing a gun at someone you don't intend to shoot, and he talks about CQB, that's close quarters battle, which usually means fighting with someone while you're inside a building. Now I found, coming from a force reconnaissance background, we found ourselves doing IA drills a lot, meaning tactics, moving around each other, running through the field, through the woods, through the desert, trying to bound and engage on the enemy. And typically we'd run like this, and, and to avoid flagging anybody else, we would reload down here. We also did that because of CQB considerations. We didn't want to be doing this in the house and possibly sweeping people. So there are time and place opportunities to do each one of these. And that's what I'm talking about here. If you absolutely are in a worst case scenario and you have to do it, just try to keep your head up. Just remember, always look for work. Insert the mag, do what you have to do, but I would prefer to either identify, load it quickly, get the stock back up because you're in a critical reload. You've got to get rounds down range. If you've got the time, boom, insert the magazine in your workspace because you may just have to move. So again, there's lots of different scenarios and lots of different techniques that I'm not absolute to. I'm always being able to adapt to any environment that I'm in. CQB, you may have to do a different reload than you do out in the battlefield doing an IA drill or out on the competition range. So it just depends on your shooting lifestyle and your job. Let's talk about the technique. When I engage, okay, when this bolt locks to the rear, the first thing I'm doing is I ID the chamber. Now, a lot of people say, well, I can feel my bolt lock to the rear. Okay, Andy. Well, sure, if you're on a competition range or you're shooting like I am right here, of course, I know my gun inside and out. I know what it feels like. But I will tell you, under critical stress, when you're in a CQB situation and you're engaging with a gun and you have armor and you have loud noises or calm headsets on, there's people talking and a lot of different things happening, sometimes you can't. Okay, so we go with that worst case scenario. If I can't, I'm going to ID. The other reason I ID is just in case I think I'm out of ammo, but it could be a malfunction. So what if I think I'm out of ammo and I go right into a reload, and I put a good magazine into a bad gun? Now I've got even more problems to deal with. Now I'm breaking the whole situation down where I could have identified and went, oh, it's a stovepipe. Oh, it's a, it's a double feed. Or it's some other problem that I could fix immediately instead of doing excessive or waste motion. So that's what you need to take into consideration on the efficiency side of the house when conducting so I'm going to play a later clip of this as well. It's not terribly complicated to figure out how that applies to what we do, right? Somebody tell me how that applies to what we do. Or there's a couple ways. Yeah. I mean, uh, this reminds me a lot of what Jason talks to Tim and I about about doing like um, sprint mocks or adversity training, where you like go sprint up and down the stairs before playing a mock for someone, so that you're just like 
panting and heart rate is up and you're sweaty and clammy and gross, you're like creating a worst case scenario for yourself so that when you go into the high pressure situation for real of an audition, you already are familiar with that feeling, you've trained in that feeling, and honestly the audition is going to seem quite a bit less bad than that. So you're, you're training and you're making decisions based on the worst case scenario because when that scenario happens, something that was designed for the best case scenario might not work, right? Because we're not in that scenario. You go ahead and pack reload. So I have one round in the chamber and an empty magazine. What's going to happen is I'm going to go ahead and engage with one round and you're going to see the bolt locked to the rear. The bolt is locked to the rear. I'm going to ID, get rid of the magazine, insert the new one. Now here's the question, okay? What do I push? I push the bolt catch to send the bolt home. But how do I do it? A couple different methods. Doctor method is to slap. You can also press. Here's the problem I have with slapping. If you are a slapper, which I see a lot of people just come up and hit, if you've got an extended paddle or it sticks out a little bit, which military and law enforcement guys can't really modify their weapons, remember this, when you slap, sometimes under stress, your hand cups. And when your hand cups, you miss the button. And then you've got to eventually press the button anyways. So I found over time that maybe two, three times out of ten, I would miss it on the first one and have to press in or eventually use my thumb. So I insert the magazine and I push the button. Now, a lot of people say, well, don't do that because under stress, you lose dexterity. Well, I call BS on that because if a fighter pilot can manipulate many buttons, levers, ailerons, and throttles and sticks while he's in an under stress situation, what makes us so different when we have a tool in our hands that may determine life or death? So think about that. And if you don't agree with that, put down the gun magazines for a second, pick up a psychology book, pick up a book on the human body and learn what your body does and what it is actually capable of. Lance Armstrong can ride a bicycle at 190 beats per minute and do a lot of different things. Change gears, talk on comms, eat a gel, drink water, but he's still doing it at speed because he trains at speed. Fighter pilots train at speed. We are no different. So when you're running a gun, remember, is it controversial or are you able to actually do it? So that's what I do. Press that button, send the bolt home, and then we're back into the fight. Cool. Uh, how else does this relate to us? I guess it's talking about all the different uh, skills that they have to acquire and how you shouldn't um, necessarily hold true to one set of skills. You should always be able to be kind of valuable between them. I suppose that's very important for us to do. Definitely. As we get later into the class, Mr. Hoheim is going to talk about um, how he rejects the dogma that has largely been in the Tiffany community. There was, like, even 20 years ago, maybe even more recently than that, there was this thing about New York players and Cleveland players and this grip and this grip and book. And like this interpretation, this excerpt, and this interpretation, and, and like there was this divide, right? Um, that largely today no one cares about, which is largely because screens are staying up longer and violin players and trombone players don't know anything about those styles. They don't care, they just care what they hear about. So uh, picking one way and only doing it that way is not going to be as valuable as having adaptability to multiple different scenarios, right? The, the way that he was talking about the reload at the beginning, that there are times when it makes sense point the barrel up. There are times when it makes sense to point the barrel down. There may be times where it makes sense to play something one way, or it makes sense to play something a different way, right? This is an example of domain general concepts being operationalized in domain-specific ways in different domains. And the other thing, the thing he was talking about, about pressing the button to finish your reload, uh, critical stress affecting perception. It's the same thing that Danny was talking about before, about in an audition when all of a sudden uh, you know, you get tunnel vision, you're, maybe your hands sweat in that scenario and they don't in others. Like for me, my hands almost never sweat. And then every now and then when I get in a super high pressure scenario, which hasn't happened for me in years, all of a sudden they'll start sweating and be like, what on earth is happening? Like, we, we don't do this, hands. And my hands are like, what we do today? Um, that, again, planning for the worst case scenario, because the best case won't work in that scenario, but planning for a worst case will work in a better scenario. Skip multiple slides, it's fine too. 
Great. All right, so this is the optimal theory of motor learning. Basically, where this came out of is in the motor learning discourse, they had had several rounds of new findings in motor learning that told them this thing works this way, this thing works this way, this thing works this way, and the old unified ideas around how motor learning worked were outdated. So these two scholars, Wolf and Luthwaite, came out and said, all these new findings, here's our uh, sort of grand unified theory of motor learning. And it, they've tested it, other people have tested it since then. It largely pretty well checks out. Um, the two big takeaways from this thing are one, external focus, and two, motivation. I'll go ahead and show us the, this diagram. This diagram. That diagram comes directly from the optimal theory from their publication there. Uh, on the left side, you have attention factors and motivation factors. Attention factors, external focus. The short version of that is that as a percussionist, they have discovered that it is more valuable for me to place my visual and kinesthetic energy on like the sticks in my hand or the drum that I'm playing than my hands themselves. Um, and there's a bunch of science behind that that they're drawing on. That basically, if I'm focused on myself, my performance goes down. Right? You see the center here, self-focus, the arrow down means performance is getting worse. Focus on task goal, the arrow up means performance is getting better. External focus, they've found through studying all of these uh, findings from the motor learning discourse that if I'm focused on my hands, things get worse. If I'm focused on what I'm holding in my hands or what I'm hitting with that thing in my hands, things get better. Motivation, autonomy, and enhanced expectancies. Autonomy is do you feel in control of what you're playing? Or are you, for example, just playing it the way that your teacher told you to and you have no choice in the matter? I believe that for you to decipher how, how valuable that is. Enhanced expectancies, the bottom level, um, simplest way of explaining that, it just means confidence. If I've seen myself play something correctly a thousand times in a row, the 1,000 month time, I'm probably going to feel pretty confident that it's going to go well. Uh, on the right side, motor performance and motor learning. Where do you think the difference between motor performance and motor learning is? On motor? Yeah. I just said motor performance, I'm assuming it's going to go on and perform. It's kind of like your yeah. muscle memory thing over. Motor learning is the same thing, essentially, right? You're kind of learning removed from the process, so that you're not deliberately learning it. You're, you're on the right track. So the thing about motor learning is it can be compound skills like uh, playing Don Juan, or it can be very simple skills like, uh, you know, waving hello, right? It can be very simple stuff or very complicated stuff that is multiple motor skills together. Motor performance is one act of the motor skill, right? So let's say it's just me, like, uh, clapping my hands. That's one motor performance. But that clap is also in context of every time I've ever clapped in my life that is motor learning, the total context of me having clapped in my life versus motor performance is one individual instance. Great. All right, the pet lab model of motor imagery. Um, this uh, comes out of, I believe, mostly sports psychology, but there's also some, some motor learning stuff involved here too. Basically, they've looked at, we've all heard the idea that visualizing what you're doing is valuable. Yes, has anyone not heard that? This model, basically says that just visualizing it is not enough. Uh, PETLEP stands for Physical, Environmental, Task, Timing, Learning, Emotional, Perspective. Right, so physical, what's my body doing? Environmental, where am I? So um, have we heard the advice from teachers that when you're about to play a recital or an audition, get pictures of the hall you're gonna play in so that you can visualize yourself in that environment? Who, who has heard something like that? Okay, one of us. Well, that idea exists out there, it's a good thing to do because it will help you visualize the actual scenario that you're in. Uh, task, what are you doing? Very simple. Timing, not hard to figure out how that matters for musicians. Learning, how am I getting better at this over time? Emotional, how do I feel in my brain and in my gut while I do this? And perspective, there's, uh, there's very interesting research in uh, this theory about uh, visualizing things from the perspective of through my eyes, from a first person perspective, or from a third person perspective of like recording me do it. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that right now. Yeah? Just a quick question about what they mean by time. I mean, obviously we know what time means to us as musicians, mm -hmm. but I imagine that to a sports player is different. Do you mean the tempo at which they would play a game, or the actual time at which the game takes place being six o'clock p.m. is a much different game to play at 12 o'clock afternoon? Good question. So the, um, the main reason, it's been a while since I've read this article, the, uh, the main one is 
the speed at which the motor skill occurs, right? So if I'm a tennis player, the speed at which I throw the ball up and whack it for a certain game. Yes, uh, there's, there's like one paragraph in here where they talk about in very certain scenarios, it can be helpful to slow something down in your visualization. And uh, it was one of those things I looked at that I was like, okay, maybe for golfers, it doesn't make any sense in most scenarios to slow things down. But in what we do, like we just understand since time is has a different level of value to what we do, uh, I'm not willing to say that you must visualize things at tempo all the time. Okay. Uh, oh, contextual interference. This is something that, um, frankly, my work needs deepening on, and frankly, the research needs deepening on. This effect is something that we don't still fully understand. Basically, this says that if you interfere with the learning or improving of a skill, the moment at which you are learning or interfering in it, you get worse, but when you recall it later, you get better. And there's actual science to back this up where they're taking people and saying, you know, just random people off the street, so to speak, and saying, throw a ball with your left hand, and the control group, when they come back, does a certain, uh, gets a certain score, and then the group that they were basically messing with while they taught them the skill, when they come back, they were better. Uh, the science on this is not fully in yet. We don't have a full picture of how it works. But who's had the experience of something goes really, really well in the practice room? Like an hour before your lesson, and then you go play your lesson, and all of a sudden you sound terrible. Who's, who's had that? Because I have. Okay, every single hand. Does anyone know a musician who's never had that? Like, I, we all have experienced this thing to the point that I think even most of our teachers, when they hear us say it, like, sometimes it sounds like an excuse, but I think most of our teachers understand it is a real thing. Uh, this idea of contextual interference, of basically getting in your own way while you're practicing, can um, mitigate that to an extent. Uh, you guys, percussionist uh, John Kilkenny is here tonight again. He is here tonight again, right? Yeah. Uh, I've heard him in the past talk about when he learns a mallet lick, then going and playing it in the wrong octave, and then going and playing it on uh, the wrong instrument. And I don't know if that's from him or if he got it from somewhere else. I won't be here for that clinic tonight asking him about it. Uh, He's got a lot of stuff from Chris Devaney, so maybe it came from him. But this idea of messing with how I learned something and then coming back to it and it's more solid when I come back to it comes out of this research. So it's extremely important. It can be. I mean, that's also about um, getting a clearer picture of rhythmic interpretation, but it can be that as well. Okay, who knows who this guy is? All right, we got a couple. So, um, this dude was a Green Beret, and then he got into sports psychology. He worked with Olympians, and then kind of by happenstance, he ended up working with classical musicians. I think he was a bass player, was his, um, was his first musician student. Um, and uh, he's worked with pros. He taught a class at Juilliard for, I think, a couple of years. He worked with New World Symphony. He's done a lot of other stuff. I met him last year at a talk he gave at Local 802 here. He's been doing a series of articles for Local 802's magazine. Um, Dr. Green actually says that this book on the right is not the one to get. His later book, Performance Success, is the one to get. Um, but I actually think this one is great because it, um, it tells the story of two of his earliest clients and um, sort of how he operationalized his stuff. So the, uh, look, there's a lot of stuff that he talks about that is very valuable. The uh, sort of key thing I want to talk about is this concept of centering, which um, for him, I'm going to give you the, the Super Eclipse Notes version. It's this three breath process where the first breath is, this is a pre-performance routine to be done right before you start to play or sing or whatever it is. The first breath is just about your breathing. The second breath is to focus on the like, center of gravity of your body, which is roughly two inches below your um, navel, I believe. And uh, then the third breath is for a cue word, right? So this is something, this is a process cue that is designed to remind you how you want something to sound. So for example, um, let's say we're playing, you played Beethoven 9 last week, right? Let's say we're playing Beethoven 9. At letter, at letter S of the Timothy excerpt from Beethoven 9, there's a group of eight bars that each have nine notes that it's very common for those notes to come out uneven, right? Either uneven in time or uneven in sound quality. So a keyword about those specific notes, uh, a bad one might be play at the same height with the same velocity. A good one might be even. It's just reminding the player what the ideal performance is. So as you've been visualizing using the pet lab model of what the best possible performance that we can 
give is. The Q word is designed to remind you and put you into that frame of mind in the three to five seconds. Th those numbers are off the top of my head, but in the very few seconds right before you start. What's a great example from sports of pre-performance routines? Patriots. You say the Patriots? Yeah. Okay. LeBron with the shock. LeBron with the shock. The chalk. Sure, before an entire game, yeah. Um, what's one before a basically a single a singular motor skill? Basketball is the right way to go. Free throw. Yeah, routines that basketball players have right before free throws. Baseball players have it too um, before they swing, but it's usually not. Um, it's not as much of a thing, and their fans don't know as much about it. So, first we're going to hear from Dr. Green. Technology willing? Come on, technology. I believe in you. Yeah, I, I, everyone knows who you are, and all the people watching, you are the master of performance coaching and, uh, and just basically have a performer. On the left, by the way, that's Sarah Willis. She plays more for the Berlin Philharmonic. Yes, that's why we all come to you. Cool. At, but you started off not with musicians, but with sports people. Right. And what is it? My first question, if I'm allowed to ask the first question today, what is it that makes a fantastic sportsman when he's, he's at Wimbledon and he's got like one serve to go before winning the title? How does he get the ball in there? How does a, a golfer, when he's got that tiny little putt, how, what is it that they train that we can learn from? Well, they, they train how to focus, how to perform under pressure, how to perform better under pressure than when they're practicing. And to me, that, that's one of the differences. I mean, there are many similarities, but one of the differences between musicians and athletes is athletes have had sports psychology for 30 years to teach Olympic and professional athletes how to perform better because of the adrenaline. That's why in the Olympics, they set not only Olympic records every four years, but world records at the Olympics. Those athletes are competing all the time World Games, University Games, Pan Am Games, Nationals. But the world records drop only once every four years dramatically because of the adrenaline and the athletes learning how to use the adrenaline. Whereas in music for many years and continuing to today, the major advice offered by teachers is just relax, which to me is totally wrong. Because if it's a high pressure situation, if it matters, if it's an audition that you want to win, you're going to feel pressure, you're going to feel adrenaline, and you're not going to be relaxed. My whole approach is I'm not even trying to relax. It's a waste of time and counterproductive, and you want to use that energy for more power, more presence, intensity of focus. Power takes a lot of energy to put air through the instrument and to stay focused through the whole concert or rain cycle. So athletes have long ago learned how to use adrenaline, and Musicians later on uh, learn how to use it for better performance. What made you make? I don't need to break that down, right? It just speaks for itself. Cool. Do you have to leave right at five? Okay. Um, we're going to run it very long. If you have to leave at five, I get it. That's like a two hour video up there, um, and it's, it is all fantastic. This is the wrong one too far, again. Okay, so who has heard of the OODA loop? Okay, great. So this is a loop that came out of fighter pilots in World War II. It's associated with the United States Air Force Colonel John Boyd. It's been used a ton in business. It's been used a ton outside of just dog fighting and fighter pilots in World War II. The, the military uses it all over the place to the point that um, I, I've seen an article, I looked it up last night, it was in a different publication than I thought it was, um, that basically says, like, stop using the OODA loop. This thing has hit such market penetration that people are tired of it. So, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, the idea that John Boyd came up with is that at any point in a dogfight, you're doing one of these things. Observe, what's going on around me? Orient, what's my place in it? Decide, what am I going to do? Act, do it. After I do it, there will be a new set of scenarios because by me doing something, the, what, what is happening in the air has changed. I need to observe it again. And then there's there's a more complicated version of this slide, uh, or this diagram that Boyd came up with, 
that has all kinds of interrelationships, and then eventually down the line, once you really understand it, you're doing all four things at once. This functioned as a template for me to create um, what you're about to see, which is sort of the core um, idea of my doctoral research here on slide 21 out of 25. This is my deliberate practice loop. Five elements, motivation, mental conceptualization, pre-performance routines, feedback, and target behaviors. Uh, just for fun, motivation, what does that come from? That I've already shown you. The optimal theory, yes, that's correct. Uh, mental conceptualization, so now we're talking about uh, visualization, right? The PetLab model applies to this. Pre-performance routines, sports psychology. Feedback is the one I'm going to talk the least about today because it's the one that this class has the most to do with, so you're going to get a lot of feedback from Mr. Hoffman this semester, so I'm not going to talk that much about that. Target behaviors. This is, uh, the best way I can describe this is this is a small piece of a performance that has a significant impact on the outcome of that performance, right? So, uh, for example, beating spot on Timpani, right? If Danny sits down on Timpani, right, the total space that is involved in Danny playing Timpani is, about, what, 20 square feet, right? Um, four drums, he's got a bag full of probably $1,000 worth of sticks, right? Danny's making a lot of motions. His feet are doing stuff, his shoulders, his elbows, his wrists, his head is doing, like, he's doing a lot of things, right? Beating spot on Timpani is an area of, what, five square inches? That are, that are valuable, maybe more if we're going out to rolls versus single notes. It's a relatively small percentage of the skill that has a massive impact on whether or not his performance of a skill is successful. Uh, okay, so motivation. You see up there I have enhanced expectancies and autonomy. Those are the things from the optimal theory. Uh, confidence and do I feel in control. Mental uh, conceptualization, visualization from, from the PetLab model. Textual interference, getting in my own way as I practice and rehearse so that as I perform, it's easier and my learning is better. External focus, again, from the optimal theory, thinking about my sticks instead of my hands, thinking about the bow, thinking about the air going through the horn, whatever it is. Your performance routines, the centering process, first time execution. I wish I had time to go more into first time execution, but I don't. Feedback, as we'll learn this semester, comes from three sources, self, peer, and coach. So I give myself feedback by recording. Um, I get peer feedback by saying, Danny, listen to me and tell me what I'm doing wrong. And I get coach feedback by going to Mr. Haheim and saying, I'm taking a lesson from you, you tell me what's going on. Target behaviors, then after I get that feedback, I look back at my video or what Danny's told me or what Mr. Haheim has told me, and I say, okay, these are the things that really matter that are getting in the way of me being as good as I'd like to be. Questions so far? Great. All right, this is maybe the coolest peer-reviewed article I've ever read. Um, it's by Lonsdale and Tam. This is uh, most peer-reviewed research about sports tends to be about uh, sports that no one has ever heard of, um, like you know badminton players in Australia or something. And I'm sure those badminton players are knowing about that. But like when people do research on tennis, it tends not to be Wimbledon. It tends to be like some high school tournament somewhere that no one really cares about. These guys did an analysis of elite basketball players, and I've read enough um, peer-reviewed articles about sports to know that when someone says elite players of something, doesn't always necessarily mean the people at the top of their game. A lot of people will write things about like elite college football players, and it won't be the ones playing in the national championship game, which makes you go, the word elite? What, what, what are we doing here? Uh, these guys analyzed the 2006 Western Conference Finals of the NBA, right? Basically doesn't get any better except for the series that happens the week after. Uh, and what they found was correct execution of a player's pre-performance routine. So every player has their own pre-performance routine before they take a free throw, right? Some will take, you know, three bounces, look off to the right and shoot. Some will take one bounce, look to the left and shoot. Some won't take any bounces, just grab the ball from the ref and shoot immediately, right? They all had an in, a, their own routine. They analyzed the film of the 2006 Western Conference Finals and found that when a player correctly executed their pre-performance routine, their percentage of hitting that shot went up by 12.43%. Now, I did the math. I think this got cut from my proposal because um, I think no one reading it cared about it except me. Uh, I did the math, and based on the average uh, margin of victory for an NBA game and the average uh, number of free throws taken, 
I, I forget the number. There are, that would affect a lot of games over an 82 game NBA season. Just 12.43% higher free throw percentage would result in the team that was supposed to lose winning just because they executed their pre-performance routine correctly. Is that a question? Yes. Yeah. So just two things. One, I'm curious, how do they know what the correct uh, pre-performance They. Um, be with yeah, it, it's been a while since I've read this. I can send it to you if you want. They basically, they looked at the totality of every shot that a player took over the course of the Western Conference Finals and said, all right, this is what this guy means to do. And then they would watch, like, let's say it's a guy who says, I, you know, I take three dribbles, I look to the right, I set, I shoot, right? And then when they saw him and he took three dribbles, waited, looks to the right and shot, his percentage went down, right? When there was something added or taken away from it, his, the percentage went down. If you know he usually had a certain bend in his knees, and then he bent his knees more, the percentage went down. When he uh, executed his pre-performance routine that he came up with you know, long ago when he was like six years old or whatever, uh, then his percentage went up by 12.43%. Danny, look familiar? Yep. Okay, so this is the coda to Beethoven 9. This is what uh, Danny played in class last week. So. There's my loop. Here's the code. I'm going to go very quickly through how the loop applies, and then we'll hear Gloria play some Strauss. Uh, so, for example, there's this excerpt. At letter S, which is the second to the bottom line, you guys can see the eight bars of nine notes. Like I mentioned before, this is theoretically very simple, but it's hard to play evenly, especially because timpani don't like to allow even strokes to happen. Uh, if those notes are even, both in time and sound quality, we sound good. If they're not, we sound bad. So playing those evenly becomes a target behavior, right? The, the evenness of those notes becomes that sort of 2% execution that has a massive effect on whether or not we are successful in performing this excerpt. Playing those evenly is a target behavior, fantastic. It's great that we know that. Why can I not scroll through my notes? Go, go, gadget, PowerPoint. Whatever, I know this well enough. So, motivation. Danny's taking Tiffany audition. You're taking the Charlotte audition. Do you want to be good when you play this? Yeah. Why? Because I would like to win a job. The end. Right? That's the, that's level one of motivation. He wants to win a job. You have to be good at this in order to win a job. So, there's, there's his motivation. Mental conceptualization. So, next, I'm going to use you as an example here. Right? Next, Danny goes through and visualizes his ideal, the best possible level that he can imagine of him, not of somebody else, not of me, not of Mr. Haha, not of Parker Lee, not of Ed Steffen, of Danny playing Beethoven 9 to the highest level that he possibly can. Within my model, using every element of the Petlet model of motor imagery. So he's thinking about how his body feels, environment, task, timing, learning, emotion, and perspective. He's thinking through all that as he creates his own uh, video, his own mental recording of the best that he can possibly perceive himself to play that. Pre-performance routines. Within my model, Danny uses uh, Don Green's centering technique, comes up with a cue word specifically for, he doesn't get to start just at S, he has to start at the top of the excerpt, but let's say, for example, and I don't know if it is or not, but let's say that the biggest problem Danny's having in Beethoven 9 is evenness of sound quality in the 30 second notes at S. His pre-performance routine before he gets into this might be after he tunes his drums and gets the DNA set, after he gets the right sticks in his hands, he starts taking his breaths, and his cue word might just be even, right? So get him focused on the ideal of what he wants there. Not, you know, like I mentioned before, not same height, not same velocity, not beating spot, not play three answers off the center of the head or off the edge of the head with 80% of my max velocity, just even, the ideal not how the ideal is achieved. Then feedback, Danny's recording himself. Danny plays mocks, that's uh, pure feedback, and Danny takes lessons from Jason Haheim at the Met, and Haheim tells him things that will help him, which I assume has been happening. Yes, and then target behavior. So then, has, this, has even this in that scenario ever been a problem for you? Oh yeah. Okay, what has Jason given you to work on that? What, what, what has he diagnosed and said, this is the reason why your hands aren't even? So there's his target behavior. Symmetrical motions in the hands in the 30 second notes at S, right? Then, 
he goes back around my loop, right? So we've been in target behaviors, he goes back around to motivation again. First time it was just I want to win a job. Now, what just happened to his enhanced expectancies? To his confidence. Because he had a lesson with one of the great timpanists of our day, and that timpanist said, you need symmetry of motion. Now, first of all, he has autonomy because he knows, he's in control of this thing that will help him, right? And presumably, in that lesson, Jason said, do X, you did X and it got a little better, right? So you have confidence to know that when you do this thing, it gets better. Cool. Mental conceptualization. Now the next time Danny goes around and visualizes himself playing this excerpt at the highest level he possibly can, he's focused on symmetry of motion in the 30 second notes of S. Pre-performance routines. As he engages in his centering technique, right? First, his keyword was even. Now, we know we have a little bit more information that symmetry helps him play even. So maybe now your keyword changes to symmetry. Right? And before he plays it, he goes, symmetry. Right? You say it out loud, maybe you do it in practice, right? And then starts playing, and that idea of symmetry is in his head. Again, not make sure I have symmetry by lifting my left hand here and engaging this angle, blah, 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 just symmetry. One, maybe two words. Then feedback. He does it all again. He watches his videotape, he plays another mock, he plays several mocks if he wants. He goes and takes another lesson and says, I've been doing this. I think this is going better, I think this is not going better. He gets more feedback and then he gets another target behavior. Are you going a level deeper? Oh yeah. Okay, what was one level deeper? Uh, getting the phrasing to be less vertical and more horizontal. A level deeper in just evenness on the 30 second minutes of S. Oh, no, that was kind of it. Okay, so theoretically, right, if you're, you, know, you take a lesson from him in a year, right, and you've spent a ton of time on technique and getting symmetry there in your hands, and then he recognizes something smaller in the symmetry in your hands, right? Maybe there's something strange in your left wrist that's not there in your right. All of a sudden, fixing that becomes your new target behavior. That information gives you more expectancy and more control over your own performance, and around and around and around we go, right? Loop obviously does not mean you get depressed.